This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Browsing the internet all day for train facts is fun and all, but I don't want to put myself at risk of getting my data stolen just because the only good picture of a locomotive was uploaded to a sketchy website. Thanks to Surfshark, I don't have to worry. It encrypts your data and keeps your browsing habits out of the hand of thieves and companies alike. Afraid of connecting to public Wi-Fi? Surfshark keeps you covered so you can browse safely on any network. On top of that, it comes with antivirus software, a built-in ad blocker, and you can use it on as many devices as you like. You jealous that us Brits can watch all this stuff made by the BBC, ITV, Channel 4, and Channel 5 for free? Just connect to a UK server and watch away. Oh, but you have to sign in. Surfshark comes with a fake ID maker, so you don't have to give your real name or identity any time you sign up for something. Or, oh, you watching railway documentaries, that TV license? over there. What? No, I'm just a humble Latvian businessman. Nothing to see here. Ha, got him again. Go to surfshark.com slash thought to get four months free when you sign up. And if you're not satisfied, they've got a 30-day money-back guarantee. That's surfshark.com slash thought and be sure to enter promo code thought. Thank you once again, Surfshark. Now, on with the video. When you hear the word tyre, you probably think of one of these. Rubber provides good traction and a smooth ride, so it makes sense to put them on a car. Trains, meanwhile, have tyres made of steel as they provide little friction and allow them to move on rails at much higher speeds. So it makes sense to put them on trains. So the question now stands, what if you gave a train rubber tyres instead of steel? In 1929, Andre Michelin, one of the two Michelin brothers that founded the tyre company of the same name, felt that passenger rail carriages could greatly benefit from using rubber tyres. While steel wheels on steel rails produce little friction, allowing trains to travel at high speeds, they also stop and accelerate very slowly, they are quite loud, and steel wheels do a poor job of cushioning most vibrations and bumps from the rails, leading to a less than comfy ride for passengers. A pneumatic rubber tyre, on the other hand, would not only improve noise and comfort for passengers, but also improve the engine's acceleration, braking distance, and allow the carriage to travel at higher speeds on poorer quality rails. Michelin's company decided to experiment with this concept, and came up with a usable design. The wheel simply consisted of an inflated rubber tyre on a metal hub that connected to a carriage's axle. A metal safety ring was fitted inside the wheel so that the carriage could still run should the tyre become flat or burst while in motion. The metal flange, meanwhile, was fitted to the axle separate from the tyre to help keep the car on the rails, though the soft tyres would deform and hug the rails anyway to keep it on the tracks. Rubber inserts were also fitted behind the flanges to help deaden additional noise that would come from any lateral motion experienced by the car that would, with a steel tyre, cause a clanging or a shrieking sound whenever it went around a bend. Confident with the design, Michelin built a handful of rail cars using these tyres. The first four prototypes never left the factory, but the fifth did in 1931, being a six-wheeled, petrol-powered passenger rail car. It was primarily used to demonstrate the benefits of using rubber tyres over metal ones, supposedly averaging speeds of over 100 kilometres an hour, and reaching a top speed of 130. Tests also found that the stopping distance for the rail car when travelling at 80 kilometres an hour was less than 100 metres, and it could accelerate to 60 kilometres an hour after only travelling 350 metres proving it was significantly faster at both stopping and starting than a standard steel wheel locomotive. They also boasted an improved traction of 35%, allowing them to tackle grades much better than their steel counterparts. The tyres were found to last for approximately 20,000 miles before needing to be replaced, and while not as long-lasting as steel tyres, the rubber ones could be easily swapped out in just five minutes should one go flat or burst while in service. 
Michelin continued to build these rail cars, constantly altering and improving the design with each iteration. By 1932, nine were working around France, proving to be useful on railways with low passenger traffic. Eventually, their performance led to other countries taking an interest in Michelin's rubber wheels, primarily Britain and the United States. A Type 9 rail car was sent to England and tried on the Great Western Railway, with many reporters speaking favourably of them, commenting on how the ride was not only smooth, but almost silent as well. The Great Western wasn't sold on Michelin's rubber rail cars, but the London Midland Scottish Railway was interested enough to trial a Type 11 rail car in 1933 and a Type 22 in 1934, before finally building their own with help from Michelin and Armstrong Siddeley, the three companies coming together to form the Coventry Pneumatic Rail Car Company. The design they produced was mostly based on the Type 22s from Michelin, these having a raised cab at one end so the driver could see both ends of the vehicle from his position, saving the need to turn it around or for the driver to switch cabs when in operation. It also included a V12 13-litre petrol engine, twin-leaf air-operated doors, exhaust silencers, and a luggage compartment that was accessed by roller shutter doors. As well as air-filled pneumatic tyres, the Coventry's wheels also had a solid rubber tyre within them for the car to run on should the outer tyre burst or deflate. Two cars were built and put into service in 1935 on the LMS, with the Type 22 Michelin cars returning to France. Meanwhile, in the United States, the Bud Company was starting to produce steel, streamlined passenger cars for use on railroads all across the country, with ambitions of building their own luxury rail cars. After catching wind of Michelin's rubber tyres, Bud made a deal with Michelin in 1931, where they could use the tyres on their rail cars, with Michelin seeing this as an opportunity to get their foot in the door of the American market. In 1932, to help promote themselves and Michelin, Bud built a 40-passenger rail car known as the Green Goose for use in America and a smaller 30-passenger railcar known as Lafayette, which was demonstrated in France. The Reading Company, Pennsylvania Railroad, and the Texas and Pacific Railway took an interest in the Bud Michelin system, and all three put in an order for their own rubber-wheeled railcars. A 47-passenger railcar was built and delivered to the Reading Company in late 1932 for use on their New Hope branch line, and the Pennsylvania received two railcars of a similar design in 1933. Interestingly, the tyres used on these cars were manufactured by Goodyear, who had to license the design from Michelin. The final Bud Michelin railcar was completed and delivered to the Texas Pacific Railway in October 1933. Named the Silver Slipper, this railcar was made up of two separate units, the motor unit and an auxiliary passenger unit. The motor unit ran on traditional steel-rimmed wheels and housed the train's air conditioning unit, as well as carrying luggage and mail. The passenger unit, meanwhile, ran on rubber-tired wheels and had air-conditioned seating for 76 people, though some of these seats were in a segregated compartment thanks to Jim Crow laws in place at the time. Silver Slipper was sleek, streamlined, and very comfortable for passengers, with the other rail cars too seeming to be well received by the people that rode in them. The railroads, however, didn't share the same sentiment, and found that, while the rubber tyres did significantly improve the ride quality of the rail carriage, there's a reason railways weren't using them sooner. Firstly was their carrying capacity. The rigid nature of steel wheels mean they can handle carrying a significant amount of weight, whereas air-filled rubber tyres can only carry so much before the pressure causes them to burst. As such, most railcars fitted with rubber wheels needed to be built as light as possible, and have extra wheels fitted to compensate, but even then, they could only hold a limited number of people before the tyres became at risk of bursting. This often led to railcars not being fitted with buffers and couplings to save on weight, making them incompatible with other railway rolling stock. Secondly was friction. Steel on steel is very slippery, which is why trains often have trouble starting. But once up to speed, they don't need to use much energy to maintain that speed, thanks to the lack of friction. 
While Michelin's tyres did help significantly improve acceleration and braking when fitted to a rail car, that increase in friction also meant that the engine needed to work harder to reach and maintain their top speeds. Speeds that were much lower than those of steel-wheeled engines. The increase in friction also contributed to wear and tear of the rubber tyres, as the wheels would generate more heat while running than steel ones would. This, combined with the perishable nature of the tyres, meant they needed to be replaced frequently, lest they suffer a flat tyre or a blowout while in service, something that wasn't possible with steel. Rubber dust would also form as the tyres broke down, heavily contributing to air pollution and making surfaces anywhere near the rails filthy. On top of that, the rail cars were costly to maintain on their own, with the tyres only making them more awkward and expensive to keep operational. But the most damning thing for these cars was their ride quality. Yes, the rubber tyres did provide a much smoother ride for passengers, but the same ride quality could be easily achieved by keeping the rails well maintained and improving a carriage's suspension. In fact, in some situations, the ride was too smooth, as the rail cars built by Bud had a tendency to bounce while in motion, frequently causing derailments. The only real problem Michelin's tyres fixed was the noise made by conventional steel tyres. But even then, that fix turned into more of a fault. It's said that the Coventry rail cars used on the LMS were prohibited from working at night or in heavy fog, as rail workers and people at level crossings couldn't hear them coming, leading to a few near misses. Despite the praise from passengers, both Coventry rail cars were taken out of service in 1937, being put into storage at the Michelin factory in Stoke-on-Trent once the LMS realised how much of a hassle they were, with both finally being broken up in 1945. The Bud Michelin cars over in the States, meanwhile, didn't fare much better. The Reading Company was greatly dissatisfied with their rail car, and the Pennsylvania ended up refitting their cars with standard wheels shortly after getting them. The Silver Slipper, meanwhile, derailed on its first test run, and proved to be mechanically unreliable, resulting in it being scrapped in 1935 after just two years in service. Despite their shortcomings, 30 Michelin railcars ended up working on France's Eastern Railway, with the design making its way to other parts of the world. A handful of Michelin railcars have been preserved, with some of them still in service to this day, such as the ones currently operating in Madagascar. Though not the success they'd hoped for, Michelin at least paved the way for modern, rubber-tired metros that are in use around the world today. Bud, meanwhile, learned their lesson from the Silver Slipper, and with this newfound experience, went on to produce the Pioneer Zephyr, one of the most well-known and revolutionary streamlined rail cars to have ever been built in the United States. Michelin's big idea of luxury railway wheels was a noble one. While they did provide some improvement over traditional steel-rimmed wheels, it wasn't enough to justify their expensive and maintenance-intense nature. Steel has remained the material of choice for railway wheels, but rubber has since found its worth as car tyres, where its benefits actually overshadow its drawbacks. I feel the moral of the story here is that not everything you try your hand at is going to work out, but it's worth finding your limits, as it can often help you find a better way to apply your strengths. Subscribe for more. Also, don't forget to check out Surfshark VPN, link in the description.